So as you're all aware, I imagine, um, the uh, COVID-19 epidemic arrived at a complicated moment for vaccination uh, worldwide. Um, in 2019, the uh, WHO defined vaccine hesitancy, hesitancy as one of the top 10 threats for global public health. But I think it's important to start with uh, terminology. I'm going to mainly focus on the concept of vaccine hesitancy, which is the concept that has become dominant in the literature on attitudes towards vaccination. It's actually a concept that designates both attitudes and behaviors, and it's mostly defined by what it isn't. Vaccine hesitancy is not the complete adherence to all vaccine recommendations. It is not either refusal of all vaccines, but it is not, uh, but it is also not the complete disengagement with uh, decision making around vaccination, the complete disinterest in vaccination. So vaccine hesitancy can uh, uh, encompass a wide variety of vaccines of attitudes and behaviors. It can consist in refusing some vaccines and accepting others. It can cons consist in delaying some. So for instance, when uh, someone decides to vaccinate their, ch their child six months later than uh, the official uh, vaccination schedule recommended. But it also uh, can consist in having doubts, but vaccinating anyway. And this concept is actually quite important because it changes the focus a little bit. Uh, before this concept became dominant, there was a tendency to assimilate all forms of vaccine, of doubts towards vaccine, to rejection or resistance. And there was a bit less interest in the diversity of negative attitudes. They all tended to be lumped together with uh, more radical forms of rejection called uh, anti-vaccinationism. And I think it's important to have that in mind because it's also a tendency that we still have to assimilate doubt, uh, to, uh, any form of doubt towards vaccines to more radical forms of, of, of anti-vaccinationism. So the, uh, the radical anti-vaccinationism, the fact uh, to refuse all forms of vaccination, it does exist, uh, it's there, but it, uh, it represents a small minority uh, compared to other forms of doubt uh, uh, encompassed in the concept of vaccine hesitancy, which are much more prevalent if we take the example of, uh, of France, for instance, this is a study conducted uh, over the past 10 years by, uh, by Professor Cohen. Um, it shows that uh, among mothers uh, of uh, young children, only 0.5 or 0.9 percent of them reject all forms of vaccination, whereas if you, if you ask them about uh, reducing the number of vaccines, uh, the uh, proportion is much closer to 25 percent. Other studies measure vaccine hesitancy in different ways, but uh, in general, you find around maybe 2% or 4% of radical anti-vaccinationism, uh, radical anti-vaccinationists in, in France, for instance, whereas vaccine hesitancy broadly defined can encompass uh, up to 70% of the population. So we're really talking about very different um, social groups and, uh, and um, uh, very different scales of, of phenomena. And what is important is that um, vaccine hesitancy tends to be focused on some specific vaccines, which can be different from one country to another. For instance, in France, doubts are focused on hepatitis B, HPV vaccination, and, and the H1N1 vaccine, whereas in the US, it tends to be focused on the MMR vaccine. But I think it's also important to make a second distinction, not just between, on, not just uh, uh, taking the continuum between anti-vaccinationism and pro-vaccination. The second dist distinction is how invested in the decision are you? How much do you look for information and think about it? <clears throat> um, and um, and it's, it's, it's very important because there are big differences in this engagement in uh, vaccine decision making and more generally in, in health related decision making. Women tend to be the ones designated for activities linked to uh, child rearing and health. So they tend to be much more invested in this decision than men and, and, uh, and fathers. But invest, investment in health-related decision-making uh, is also the reflection of the type of control you have over your own life. So we also observe in general gradients uh, in investment in health-related decision-making with marginalized groups, those with pre precarious jobs, those with less financial resources or levels of educational attainment, who tend to be less invested in health-related decision-making. So it's not just a continuum, it's rather a typology with both different degrees of reluctance towards vaccines, but also different degrees of active or uh, passiveness uh, of the attitude. 
And it's important because it also reminds us of the fact that most people who comply with vaccination re recommendations actually don't know much about vaccines and are, are not necessarily consciously pro-vaccine. Um, so it's really quite important to distinguish, for instance, between passive performers and, uh, and active um, engagement with vaccination as a uh, positive uh, influence on society. But what explains the emergence of doubts and resistance? I think today uh, it is widely accepted that um, uh, uh, negative attitudes towards vaccines reflect wider issues of trust in a given society. Um, but often the way this is understood is through, um, is through a framework that can be called the crisis of institutions. And it's a framework that, that has been put forward in the 1970s by the great uh, political scientist Ronald, Ronald Inglehart, who found that uh, trust in uh, public institutions really decreased in the United States starting in the 1970s. And this framework has been um, basically applied everywhere with the theory that uh, we are, most democratic societies are living, uh, experiencing a, dis a disenchantment towards democracy, political actors, and all its institutions all the way to uh, a disenchantment towards um, science and expertise. Um, the problem with this framework is that um, it doesn't work that well with most countries outside of the US. If you take France, for instance, um, so there's, I, I, I showed a, a graph from a, a, an article by Van der Velle and, uh, and colleagues. Um, what we see, it's the gray box, is that basically in France, uh, well, the French have uh, all, well, at least at, at least till the 1970s and, and before, had little uh, trust in, uh, in politicians and, uh, and uh, uh, democratic institutions. And this trust is also very, uh, well, fluctuates a lot. But I think uh, the, uh, the great uh, the merit of this framework is that it points in the right direction. It, it really reminds us that vaccination is not just about science and doctors. Um, it's about a wide variety of actors ranging from the, the makers of the syringes to um, uh, the uh, uh, health agencies, uh, uh, private uh, companies, pharmaceutical companies, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and uh, this uh, 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 calls back the analysis of two great sociologists of risk, uh, Ulrich Beck and Anthony Giddens, that remind us that actually what is... Uh, um, the, the, the one, one of the main characteristics of, uh, of um, modern societies, of advanced societies, is that increasingly everything we use in day-to-day -day life uh, involve a great variety of actors, most of which we don't know about, and uh, it involves, in, 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 in any kind of behavior, involves at least some amount of trust in a lot, a wide range of actors. And most of this trust is actually a complete blind trust because we don't know who, do, who does what in the process. But there's also a reversal of that, which is a lot of uh, this process in, entails a lot of distrust because every time a scandal uh, uh, emerges, well then we, uh, people are reminded of that blind trust. So there's always a kind of balance between trust and distrust and how heavily it weighs on one side or the other um, depends a lot on whether you feel the system benefits from you. So studies on, on, on overall trust in various uh, developed countries tend to show that there's less trust amongst, among the less trust in institutions, public institutions in particular. Um, there's less trust among the poorer, the socially marginalized, and, and, and minorities who suffer from discrimination. So these are crucial elements to understand vaccine hesitancy. Uh, they are structural factors in, in some way, but it doesn't really explain the emergence of vaccine hesitancy. It does. It tells us of the conditions that are necessary for vaccine hesitancy to emerge, but not why, but not uh, vaccine hesitancy directly. What triggers it? Indeed, how does this distrust in institution, institutions become applied to vaccines and not to other things? Uh, indeed, we rarely distrust everything. There's a kind of competition for the bandwidth of our attention. So how do vaccines in particular come to be the place where all these tensions are expressed? So here I think it's important to take uh, the case of France again. Uh, um, it's vaccine hesitancy has become um, really much more prominent since 2009 
2009, and the major controversy over the safety of the H1N1 flu vaccine. So why so late, even though these structural factors um, arrive, well, were there for at least uh, two decades before that? And um, this is very important, this, this idea of what triggers uh, the, uh, this, this distrust. And it brings me probably to one uh, a subject you were expecting me to, to, to broach earlier, which is uh, the anti-vaccine movement. So today, one of the main reasons uh, put forward in the literature on uh, why there's uh, so much vaccine hesitancy at the moment is that we would be um, confronted at the moment with a resurgence of the anti-vaccine movement. So the, this, uh, this narr the narrative is, is the following. So vaccines have always um, uh, elicited uh, uh, rejection by at least a small minority of people who reject the principle behind vaccination science. So uh, there's the, the, this anti-vaccinationism is characterized by maybe anti-science attitudes, uh, 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 defense of radical alternative medicine and conspiracy theories. And today, what has changed is that the internet and social media would allow these actors to reach a much wider audience than before, because internet uh, is ev everything is easily acceptable on the internet. Well, this is part of the explanation. Of course, there are radical anti-vaxxers. Anti they are there, and if you go on the internet, you, you will find them. But in front, this uh, the the. the the spread of vaccine hesitancy doesn't cor correspond very well to the evolution of internet use. Actually, what explains the spread of vaccine hesitancy in France is not the new social media, but the traditional media. Basically, the, uh, the, the, the strong prevalence of vaccine hesitancy in France dates back to the multiplication of vaccine-related controversies in the mainstream public sphere, in the mainstream media. We have seen a succession of a very public controversy over the safety of the H1N1 flu vaccine, of the use of aluminum-based uh, adjuvants, of the HPV vaccine, and of the use of uh, multivalent uh, vaccines. And, it's, and that's a quite, I think, an important point, because it reminds us that vaccine hesitancy is usually not the product of mobilizations of very radical actors on marginal um, uh, media, such as the social media, um, but it is much more grounded in mainstream public debates. And the second point I would like to make on, on this issue, on the issue of anti-vaccine movement, is that, is that this term, the term anti-vaccine, tends to lump together actors with very different discourses. We tend to think of all vaccine critical activists as conspiracy theorists, anti-science, defenders of alternative medicine. But there's actually a great di di diversity in the degree of radicality of their arguments. So the same distinction that I put forward, well, with the rest of the um, specialists of vaccine hesitancy, between rejecting only some vaccines and rejecting all vaccines, you find it also at the level of um, activists. Um, uh, if you take the case of France, for instance, um, we, with two colleagues, Florent Cafio and Paul guillet we, uh, we we looked at the presence in the media of uh, all the uh, vaccine critical actors. And what we found is that those who only uh, criticize some vaccines and strove to distinguish themselves from radical anti-vaxxers with discourses such, discourses such as, well, we're not against vaccination in general. And for instance, some of them promote uh, MMR vaccination, but have only a problem with maybe the hepatitis B vaccine or the HPV vaccine or the use of aluminum-based adjuvants. So all these argue, all these actors, they are the ones in pink in this, in this figure. And the size of the dot is how often they have been mentioned in the French mainstream media since 1990. And what we see is that the only ones to have had uh, a major uh, visibility in the mainstream media are the ones who really managed to distinguish themselves from radical anti-vaccinationists. And that's quite important because their discourse, which sounds much more like, uh, much more credible scientifically, much more credible politically, because what they say is not that basically all the institutions are out there to kill everyone and, and, and or inject uh, microchips. What they're saying is that sometimes institutional processes uh, don't function as well as they should, and there's a reform there to be uh, put in place. I'm not saying they are right, but they are much more credible uh, scientifically and politically. And this is how they can convince both 
journalists to give them a, uh, a wider audience, but also they are much more convincing to the public uh, in, general, uh, in general. So in France, for instance, uh, the actors at the core of all the controversies I evoked uh, just before, they are uh, actors who really rejected anti-vaccinationism. And, um, and it's important to, to pay attention uh, to the different way vaccine critics build their arguments. Also for another reason, it's that the way they build their arguments also participates in different ways of politicizing uh, the issue of vaccination, each vaccine. Uh, how they are, how do they anchor their critique in wider worldviews, wider concerns? Uh, well, if we take the example of, of HPV vaccination, well, for instance, um, you can defend and be very pro HPV vaccination because you perceive the vaccine as one of all vaccines and vaccines in general as a symbol of the progress of science. But you can also perceive the HPV vaccine as just one of all the vaccines, but you are against vaccination in general because you believe the state is trying to uh, manipulate you and kill half of the population. Um, but you can also be against the HPV vaccine, not just because it is uh, a vaccine in general, but just because it's one of the several vaccines that contain aluminum and uh, being very invested in environmental uh, mobilizations, you are very sensitized to the issue of uh, um, uh, aluminum in general, and you connect it with other issues such as BPA and things like that. But then another way of being against uh, the HPV vaccine is by perceiving it as one of the several vaccines that are against uh, sexually transmitted disease, diseases such as the hepatitis B vaccine. And being a social conservative, you believe that uh, the best way to tackle uh, sexually transmitted diseases is not through a vaccine, but through a strong moral regulation of sexual behavior. So the way vaccines are singularized or put together, lumped together, or on the contrary, uh, took as symbols of vaccination in general, is also articulated to uh, more moral and political arguments that you can make around uh, the, the, the specific vaccine. And uh, so, yeah, which brings me to my conclusions, which is, uh, uh, which is that the literature on vaccine hesitancy, hesitancy has not given much um, uh, attention to a future HIV AIDS vaccine, which is quite understandable because it's, uh, it's not, uh, it, it won't be available in the very, very foreseeable future. But it does enable to identify several challenges a future vaccine against HIV AIDS might face. So the first one is that new vaccines tend to elicit resistance because less is known about their side effects, but also because they are not part of the routine of vaccination yet. So for instance, if you take all the uh, vaccines that are required for children, they are part of the routine and they just disappear from uh, 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 consciousness in some way. They are the 11 vaccines that you must make. Introducing a new vaccine um, uh, uh, raises attention to this vaccine and also the question of how much um, uh, visibility we have on the long-term side effects of these vaccines. So this is something that we saw, for instance, with the introduction of the HPV vaccine, but also other vaccines uh, more recently, for instance, the H1N1 vaccine in 2009. The second challenge is the perception of the risk posed by, the, by HIV AIDS. In many countries, this disease does not strike as much fear as it did a couple de de decades ago. Um, and especially in a context where treatments and other means of prevention exists. The third challenge is the association between AIDS and sexuality. This could be, and, and it will likely be an issue for acceptability among the more conservative segments of society. This is clearly something that we see today around vaccination against HPV. And even in, 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 a, in, a, in, in context where the vaccine has been a bit desexualized, such as in France by, for instance, changing the age at which the, at which the vaccine is injected from uh, 14, 15 years old to 11, 12. And another point is that, is, is that um, it is necessary to remind that the challenges are likely to be very different from one country to the other, depending on how prevalent vaccine hesitancy is in general is before the arrival of a vaccine, how the vaccine inserts itself into the fabric of society, all the issues around trust and in institutions, who promotes it, who does it, who injects the vaccine, etc., etc., but also how um, much the disease circulates 
in um, each country. When it comes to vaccine hesitancy and vaccination, one size clearly does not fit all and approaches must be tailored to each context. And my last point will be that even though this talk has been focused on vaccine hesitancy, so basically attitudes, beliefs, representations, it is important to remember that access to the vaccine is as important, if not even more important, as a driver of, vaccine, uh, of vaccination rate as attitudes. And this is something that we're seeing at the moment with COVID-19, with many people who are not particularly against vaccination, uh, that vaccine, who are not vaccinated, but more because the vaccine has not been um, integrated into their day-to-day -day lives. They have not been reached. Thank you for your attention.